How Genghis Khan supplied his army. The Mongol logistics. Let's go. An army is only as effective as its ability to feed and supply its own men. And so the true. armies of the Mongol Empire were no exception. As with so I'm assuming that it's going to be very um, independent. So um, they're going to have independency to sort of, because they're nomads, live off the land. I'm assuming that's going to be a lot of it. Much of the but Mongol military. Let's see if I'm popular wrong. depictions of the logistical capabilities of the 13th century Mongol army are a mix of hyperbole and exaggerated claims of Mongol feats. Okay. For this next part of our series on the Mongol army, we will detail the means and methods the great khans utilized to supply their forces across the breadth of I'm Eurasia. I'm liking it. I like this type of info. Hoarding... So let's see what they've got in store for us. Quite rightly, most discussions of the Mongols' logistical ability have focused on their lives as nomads and how they utilize their animal herds, sheep, goats, oxen, camels and horses. Mm -hmm. As pastoral nomads, their very lives provided them excellent experience in the skills of strategic logistics. Okay, Every makes seasonal sense. movement had to be well planned and so they organized were used to for it. timing of the weather and pasture mm -hmm. availability. Pasture had to be carefully managed to avoid overgrazing. The animals kept in the right proportions for water usage and avoiding its contamination. How did it change Pastures though? for winter grazing needed to be change? secured and avoided. Lacking sufficient alternative fodder, the animals needed to be able to provide for themselves by eating through the snow, the sheep, goats and oxen following behind the horses as they instinctively dug through the snow with Ooh, nose and hoof. Smart. In turn, each animal provided milk, meat, felt, clothing and more, providing nomads much of their requirements to survive. Each nomad had to learn how many animals were necessary to survive off of and had a lifetime of experience moving vast herds Which of gave livestock them the from independence horseback over great on. distances. Any Mongol who survived to adulthood knew how to withstand harsh environments, live off it little, make well, use was... of every part of the animal, and take advantage of local... Not so much ingrained, but taught to them and embedded into them from a, such a young age. Resources. All valuable skills for an army on the march. As stated, the Mongols did not provide fodder for their herds, subsisting them almost entirely off of grasses. Nice. In the great Eurasian steppes, this provided any nomadic people an immense advantage, not requiring the difficult and lengthy procurement of grain supplies for troops and horses. Making Larger horse breeds of sedentary societies, for example, cannot maintain body weight and strength enough to campaign from only grass alone and require regular feeding of hay or preferably grain. I didn't For know that. For the smaller horses of the Eurasian okay. steppe, grass provided their necessary nutritional intake. With no shortage of grass in the steppe, it was also much easier to field immense herds of horses, far more than any sedentary rival power could compare to. Mm. A single Mongol warrior could go on campaign with five or more remounts, rotating I knew that. between the horses so as not to overexert a single animal. While the vast herds of their animals were a key aspect of everyday life in Mongolia, the five snouts were rarely all brought on campaign. Sheep and okay. goats simply cannot travel as quickly or as long as horses. Five kilometers per day, or three miles, is a reliable speed with these animals. Depending on the campaign, and as conditions allowed, we sometimes see instead a central, slower moving army, which may have sheep, goats, supply and tool carts pulled by oxen, and some families, a base camp called an Ordu, generally commanded by the Khan's or a general's wife in his absence. All right. The okay. warriors would ride separately in flying columns well ahead of the Ordu. Traveling with only their horses, these columns could strike with greater speed before returning to this slower main body to resupply on those things which they could not have carried with them. All this right, would that's mean stocking up on staples of the Mongol diet to carry back with them for the next stretch of nice. the horse-only part of the attack. Okay, that's quite cool. A group of ten men, an Arban, 
would stock up on strips of dried meat, boats, or dried milk curds called arul, or cheeses called izgi. The Arbans returning out to campaign carried this among themselves and their spare horses, right. which themselves were a source of nutrition for the Mongols. Mares were preferred, as both their milk and blood could be drunk, providing mm -hmm. nutritional value when other alternatives were scarce. Right, okay, that's interesting, and it's not so much of a nomad um, fend for yourself off the land as I thought. They still sometimes have this carriage train that they can sort of go back to and get other things. But obviously when that's all gone, they can then result to these two things here. If the horse died on the march, then it would be cut up on the spot for its meat to be reused. Even the bones would be used for a broth called shulen, thickened with millet and whatever pieces of meat and vegetables could be collected. Okay. These meals were augmented by hunting when they could, be it big game, enemy yeah. livestock, or so marmot, they could, a they useful would. practice to keep their archery skills sharp as well. Little was wasted, and numerous primary sources remark, often with disgust, at the willingness of the Mongols to eat anything. <laughs> but the Mongols <laughs> knew quite well that picky eaters did not last long in the cold. Win. yeah they didn't at all so i think when you become a warrior you've just got to get used to eating the worst things possible and just your dietary needs and just hitting those marks that's it yet even in the step the supplying of so many animals was not without issue especially at the end of winter or in drier years when campaigning against their enemies this became an even greater struggle for there were simply not the same expanses of grassland to rely upon the further they, they rode would. from the steppes. Yep. In so how did it change? This, the Mongols relied on an exceptionally predatory foraging strategy. Mongol armies travelled in divisions and smaller units, spreading themselves out across the countryside, feeding their horses on both the smaller areas of grassland and local grain stores, mm -hmm. while the riders would feed themselves on the peasants' harvests. So it's good that they were able to adapt and they have more than one way to supply their army. This would also play into their strategy of harassing and driving the peasants from farms and rural villages towards major urban centres, spreading fear and straining the enemy's resources. Mm. It also had an advantage of making it difficult to react to Mongol armies. For the defenders, reports would come in of Mongols everywhere, coming and going in each direction. The chaos of the panic-stricken flights of the because peasants was only would have like certainly small brought bands. with them exaggerated stories of the scale of the mm. enemy forces. So sometimes they have more than one confusion. horse as well. This takes us to one of the most popular myths of the Mongols, that they were a shockingly fast force, a lightning bolt from the steppes. No, it's just they had this lots of strike forces at small mans. Confusion caused small by Mongols. Men, when mans. they were striking cities hundreds of kilometers apart, it would seem they were crossing great distances at lightning speeds. But calculations by John Mason Smith Jr., noting when available the rough length of time and distance traveled by the Mongol armies, found there could be great variation in the speed at which they traveled. The greatest speed recorded was the great invasion of Western Eurasia okay. under Batu and Subutai in the 1230s. What was their the speed? journey from Karakoram to the Volga River nearly 5,000 kilometers over an estimated six months, made an average daily speed of around 27 kilometers per day. Okay. This part of the journey, with little campaigning and nothing but grassland before them, was made with the greatest haste. Mm, In they just didn't want to stop. The average kilometers per day for other campaigns with available data was around 22 to 24 kilometers uh, per day. So it's not Smith that suggests that much the faster. speed made by Batu and Subutai was the maximum top speed for an army based on steppe horses in ideal conditions. Yep. Time in the day needed to be given for the horses to graze and sleep, and as it takes longer for horses to meet their daily feed requirements via grazing <laughs> rather than grain, mm -hmm. this puts a cap on the top speed of these armies. Makes sense. And yet such ideal conditions would not be met elsewhere. Smith is also able to make calculations for much of Hulagu's so route it's actually during the his best march type of terrain for them. 
At the I thought it was the worst. part of his journey from Karakorum to Almalik, Pulugu covered approximately 2,697 kilometers in some six months, some 15 kilometers per day. Oh, Across that's quite Transoxiana slow, though. and Iran, Hulagu rarely made such speeds again, usually between six and Is that nine because kilometers of bad per day, weather, depending, that, oh, bad and terrain. often halting yeah. for months at a time. For Hulagu, the campaign was much more methodical than the immense tidal waves they are often depicted as. The sources describe Hulagu marching in the mornings, then allowing the horses to graze over the afternoon and sleep through the night, right. while his own men rested and drank. It's important to note that for armies like Hulagu's, often estimated around some 70 to 150,000 men, only a part of the force was actually Mongolian. Aside from fellow nomadic peoples mm -hmm. like the steppe Turkic tribes who would handle the journey similarly, semi-nomadic Khitans and Jurchen accompanied them, as did Tanguts, northern Chinese, especially as engineers, and other subject people along the route through Transoxiana and Iran. Such huge and varied armies could not live off Mongol mares' milk and blood. Instead, such campaigns took advantage of the ever-developing administration of the Mongol Empire. So of course it was going to slow them down, the fact that the um, other types of people and types of cultures who are not used to eating the mare's blood and drinking the mare's milk and yeah drinking the mare's blood and milk and also probably eating horse meat they're not used to it so they're not going to be able to do it because they're not acquired to it so they have to get sustenance in other ways so obviously you had to adapt so once again they are adapting to the people there but in this time this situation i'm imagining it's going to be slowing them down slightly by the time of hulagu's expedition great khan Moncur ordered vast depots of supplies to be made for his brother's army along the route. Yes. Immense hills of skins of flour okay. and wine produced from across Western Asia. I'm surprised they were never attacked by opposing forces to then be able to use those grains for themselves. All or they might have been. that Hulagu's armies may need were to be cleared and let fallow for their horses. Roads were cleared, bridges built and mended, or ferries prepared oh, so to he aid did in get their passage, both for the men and the many carts traveling with That's them, very carrying interesting. supplies, weapons, and tools to construct siege machines. Surely this would have gave the opposition, seeing that happening, would have gave the opposition information that attack is coming, right? As Hulagu marched across Asia, he met with Mongol-appointed governors and vassals, who had to arrange more supplies for the army. Right. Marches had to be carefully timed, aiming to avoid the harshest summer weathers and take advantage of pasture availability. Mm. While it is it's not like what to think I thought of the Mongols all. living and fighting purely from their horses, by the time of their great campaigns, yeah. they needed supplies as much as everyone else. These okay. marches were generally made without the families of the warriors. Even for Hulagu himself, most of his wives were only able to arrive in the Ilkhanate by the end of the 1260s, only then did they learn of Hulagu's death in 1265. If even for a royal prince it was hard to bring his wives with him, Ooh, then a great okay. many Mongolian families Definitely were permanently able to separated at this point. by the campaigns. For Tama garrisons stationed on the frontiers of the empire, so did change such a consequence was outright stated. Traveling without their original families in the regions where these Tama forces were based, such as parts of modern Afghanistan and Azerbaijan, these men took local wives and mixed with local cultures. I see. The family separation policy of the Khans accounts in part for the rapid absorption of the Mongols into the Turkic and Farsi peoples in the west of the empire. Okay, so that's also interesting and I kind of understand it. Much of the aforementioned comments are also reflected in the arming of the Mongol soldiers. For their base equipment, each Mongol was expected to produce and maintain his own weapons, building his own bows and arrows, his own saddle mm. and the like. At I remember the hearing the about conquest, this. Yeah, they, they learn how to make a, a bow at a young age, don't they? Blacksmithing in Mongolia was difficult, but not impossible. Okay. Access to raw materials was a great hurdle, and often relied on trading with the Chinese dynasties to their south. For these reasons, specialized equipment such as swords and full sets of metal armors 
would have been uncommon and restricted to those with the wealth and means to afford them. Okay, luxury if the items. average Mongol trooper had a metal weapon, it was likely cheaper yet effective, such as mm. maces and spears, or if metal armor, perhaps nothing more than a helmet. As the empire expanded, so too did their access to more varied weapons and armors. Okay. A great many Mongols simply must have repurposed looted equipment. After a battle, so, Genghis Khan as, ordered... the, as they defeated and become more and gained more land and become more victorious, they were able to also get more wealth for themselves by taking things were to collect and, and also reusing the weapons and armor of the defeated enemy forces. Though doubtless the Mongol elite and bodyguards were given priority in this. Yep. From both conquest and tribute, as well as the forced migrations of artisans and craftsmen, the Mongols gained reliable access to great numbers of blacksmiths and the raw materials necessary for their crafts. Nice. On the eve of the invasion of the Khwarezmian Empire, one of the rising members of Chinggis Khan's entourage and a great minister of the Mongol Empire, Chinkai, founded Chinkai Belasigan, meaning Chinkai's city, in western Mongolia. Made of mainly captured and relocated Chinese craftsmen, Chinkai turned this into one of several manufacturing centers in Mongolia. Ooh. Both a farming settlement and weapons production facility, it supplied Chinggis's host as they moved west for the invasion of Khwarezm. Yo, nice. Even the imperial capital, Karakoram, had smithies and arms producers. It is unclear to what extent these finished products actually made their way to the regular soldiers outside of arrow production. By providing their warriors millions of iron-tipped arrows, the Khans would have been giving them the most effective and deadliest assistance they could. Mm. No evidence seems to indicate that there was ever a concerted effort to armor the vast majority of Mongol troops or provide them a regular kit though the soldiers were expected to have some base equipment, such as knives, bows, ropes, sewing kits, and other basic tools. Life, use, uh, the life essential tools. The Franciscan friar, William of Rubruck, during his return journey to Europe from the court of the Grand Khan in the early 1250s, had only two of the 20 Mongols assigned to protect him armoured. Both were in hauberks of mail from the Alans of the Northern Caucasus, according Ooh, okay. to Rubruck. Other and travelers, rest, well. such as John de Plano Capini and Marco Polo, also indicate that outside of the Khan's Keshig, little effort was made to furnish the regular army with equipment. Communication between their forces was an important tool of the Khans. In this, they developed one of history's most famous postal systems, the Yam. Situated on average I roughly 30 this. kilometers apart, the Yam stations, also mm -hmm. known as Ortu, were locally supplied relay stations, which snaked across the whole of the Mongol Empire. The communities the Ortu were situated in provided foodstuffs and animals. Messengers bearing either written or verbal communication would ride furiously to each station. There they would be resupplied, fed, jump onto fresh horses and be on their way to bear messages to and fro. Each user was provided a passport called Garega in Mongolian or Paisa in Chinese. Yeah, the highest I level this. of the Garega, the golden tiger head, bore the name of Chinggis Khan and stated, By the name of Chinggis Khan, endowed by the eternal blue heaven, this man is empowered to act with the same freedom as I myself should exercise had I come in person. I remember this as well from also the show, the Netflix show, Marco Polo. Um, obviously, it covers a later period in time, but I do remember this thing. Like, if you had this, then obviously you had to be treated with utmost authority. Below, it would list what supplies this level of passport provided the bearer. The Yam system may have been brought to Chinggis Khan's attention by defectors from the Jin Empire be they Chinese, Jurchen or Kitan, or they may have organically emerged out of necessity of retaining some semblance of authority over the ever-growing empire. Okay. No matter the origin, Chinggis Khan had recognized the utility of such a system by the 1210s. Nice, the quite Yam early. The was expanded over the course of the 13th century, particularly under Ogadai and Moncur, but it was continually disrupted, and it was a source of frustration for the locals 
who had okay. to both supply the yam and the greedy officials and mm. merchants taking advantage of their generosity. I In see. much of the empire, its presence was marginal even at the height of the authority of the Great Khans. Yet it provided means to connect far-flung sections of the empire so they weren't and happy about contact it. between the various long-ranging armies carrying out the Khan's will. Via the Yam, orders could be relayed across the empire to organize timetables, such as the new censuses carried out on the orders of Monkeur, and then the demands for troops and supplies to be mobilized. Because of this, Hulagu mm. was able to meet up with more contingents and successfully stopped food depots without needless delays. By the time he reached the Hashashin fortress of Maimundis, so successfully had the Yam stations been able to line up the campaign, that forces sent from the Jochid Ulus were able to cross the Caucasus and unite with Hulagu in northern Iran for so the fall of these fortresses. As if it were, Both armies if had it was marched utilized on opposite world. sides of the Caspian Sea. So fucking Our series sick. on the what Mongol army will continue. So make sure you're Ooh. subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing. It helps immensely. And I hope you guys definitely go do that. They make amazing content. If you haven't already, head over to their page. That link's in the description box down below. They make amazing content. If you enjoyed my reaction to this series, uh, to this episode, then you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and I'm going to catch you in the next video.